program here at uh, the Department of Experimental Psychology under the supervision of Robin Murphy and Nicholas Young. Um, I am going to introduce Philly or Dr. Gilad Feldman. Sorry for the pronunciation if I've if I've mispronounced it, but yeah, he's known as Philly. Um, he's from the University of Hong Kong, where I did my undergraduate degree, and I'm guessing he's there at the moment, looking at his background. Yes, he is. Um, he has been conducting the mass replication project at Hong Kong U, and that's what he's going to be telling us about. Um, and being involved in it before, just from a student's perspective, I want to say that he is such a great mentor and a person to be like um, implementing this entire project at Hong Kong U. It's very impressive, um, as you'll find out very shortly. And um, it's it's very great. It's very organized. And it's it's interesting how he's shown the capability of undergraduate students. And yeah, I hope that you guys will enjoy his talk as I have multiple times. So moving on, Billy. Thank you. Uh, very happy to have the opportunity to, to talk to you. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm trying as much as possible to uh, approach students and early career researchers and I don't get a lot of opportunities usually when I give talks I, I give talks to assistant professors and above and then I feel like I'm missing my target audience so finally I get I get to talk to uh, you know people who, who are actually involved in this project and, uh, and can join the project uh, this is this project is meant for early career researchers and students so I'm really hoping that uh, um, First, you'll learn a little bit about what we do, and then that you'll find some inspiration in this to either do something like this in your uh, own department, in your own labs, in your own uh, careers as you progress uh, in, in your own journeys, or uh, join us. Uh, there's so many opportunities for you to join us. Everything is open. Everything is collaborative. Everything that I show you, uh, you can come and, and be a co-author, be a collaborator. Um, so I'll, I'll just I'll just get started to tell you a, a bit about um, about the, the project. So I uh, the title of this uh, thing is towards collaborative credibility revolution open science meta research. This has a lot to do with all the big names, uh, big titles of everything that's been happening in the last uh, decade or so, and our realization that uh, we need to change the way that we uh, do science. Uh, but I want to focus mostly on this uh, part over here about uh, ECR and student-led. Um, so uh, we see a lot of the changes happening from, you know, the, the faculty and, and such, but I think uh, reproducibility, Sam, uh, some of the people involved uh, from Oxford that I, that I know and, uh, and follow, definitely an inspiration in showing that uh, a change can happen uh, bottom up uh, come from students and ECRs and I think our, our project tries to demonstrate this and has been successful in what we've done uh, so far. Uh, just to say that this uh, talk is sort of like a teaser. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll go through things very uh, briefly. But if you want the longer version, we did a three hour workshop session about what every component is. Um, and if you want the three hour version, you can just go on the YouTube. Uh, I also uh, didn't say this, but uh, uh, throughout you'll see the slides. You can download the slides. Uh, the slides that I'm going to present to you are selected few, and there's lots of hidden slides. So uh, regardless of whether you want to follow or not, it's it's worthwhile for you to download this. And if you want to know more, just go on this YouTube uh, video, and there's lots of links and resources over there for you to, uh, to dig in deeper. Um, also, if you want other talks, uh, all sorts of things about what is my journey towards open science. I have not always been in open science. Actually, I've, I've not always been in psychology. I actually grew up in a business school and transitioned to social psychology. Uh, I've been part of all sorts of labs uh, that did all sorts of things that I think this uh, replication crisis uh, has hit. Uh, pretty badly. So I've been involved, I've gone through all sorts of things, and if you want to know about my personal journey and, and what I think about open science, there's all sorts of things that you can uh, see on YouTube as well. The main argument that I want to uh, kind of relate to you 
is that in my humble view, credibility revolution is needed uh, following what is, uh, has come to uh, be coined the replication reproducibility crisis. And uh, the main arguments that I have, and I think uh, you uh, had a lot of readings on this and discussions on this is that we definitely need to improve the way that we do science. And this is why I joined the open science uh, movement. And then collaboration, we have to work together. I used to work on stuff on my own and <laughs> I realized that this is not sustainable, uh, especially if we have something that uh, resembles a crisis or feels like a crisis and we really must start working together in order to uh, address this and support one another in this kind of journey. And, and then my realization that actually the, uh, the main, the key for change, the, the main resolution perhaps for this uh, crisis or driving the credibility revolution are students and early career researchers. And I would like throughout the presentation for you to uh, get that the main message is that, that you, early career researchers, can make a difference uh, in, in this uh, journey. So this is our team. Uh, it has grown a lot. We started, we've been running this for three years now, and it's quite amazing when you look at the, you know, where people are coming from. Um, and you know, we took a lot of inspiration from the way that the Riot uh, Club and uh, Reproducibility and others, uh, and this has become a community where uh, people uh, come from all around the world and help one another. And all of these are early career uh, researchers. So we've got lead authors and I'll explain what lead authors are. Uh, there are peer reviewers and you can see a representative from a former HQ and now in Oxford, uh, Reedy, and then um, uh, lots of uh, guided thesis students. But the core of this project, and this is what I want to uh, explain a little bit about, is that I decided to completely uh, change the way that we teach our undergraduates. So I've taught in these three years, I've taught about uh, 300 uh, um, undergraduates in my, in my courses. You can see kind of like the who, where, in what course over here. So it's mostly fundamentals of social psychology. So second year, second year undergraduate. We started doing these projects uh, with them. Fourth year, advanced social psychology, and then judgment decision making is an elective, typically third year or so. So from second year undergraduate to fourth year undergraduate, uh, all the projects that you'll see now are conducted by undergraduates, supported by um, a team of uh, teaching assistants. Sometimes we have um, guided thesis uh, students uh, that are both undergraduate and, and masters, but this is, this is what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a team of students supported by early career researchers. I feel like every talk should start with this kind of slide just so we are on uh, track, you know, we understand each other of what, where we're coming from. So I, follow this. I've been following this for um, five years or so. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, the crisis is not limited to psychology. It actually far extends beyond that. And uh, almost every uh, month we see another result come out that uh, goes well, well beyond the uh, psychology. So we've got uh, medicine, science to stop working, uh, chemical research, economics. Most recently, this is August 2020, empirical computer science. So if we have reproducibility and replicability problem over there, this just goes to show that uh, this is very extensive. This has led me in my postdoc uh, when I was in Maastricht University, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So I did uh, one postdoc in the Netherlands for two years. And I was not too far away from a lot of open science folks. Uh, Lackens was in Eindhoven an hour away. But I was struggling to kind of make sense of uh, what is happening and what I should do about this. And then I just sat down during my postdoc and came to uh, kind of um, put my principles on paper, something that I would like to follow at the beginning of my career. I think most of us uh, kind of uh, follow some of this especially if you're a part of the open science community. Um, so all sorts of things like, of course, doing power analysis, but then just moving, uh, implementing pre-registrations, but moving also to doing register reports, whatever the findings are, including if they're the null. So we, we communicate everything. We do a lot of replication. So this is what this uh, mass replication is about. I share everything as preprints, working as, as community and collaboration, but I think that the essence of everything is just being completely transparent about everything. It's not just sharing you know, the data and the material and the code, 
sharing everything, every decision, every step of the way. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that every time we have a stage, I open that stage for open peer review. So everybody can come in and look at our Google Docs and comment. Uh, so everything is, is shared. And of course, afterwards, we, we open things up uh, peer review and afterwards, if people want uh, to follow up on this. This is the traditional model of how we teach undergraduates and, and MA, uh, unfortunately still so in the University of Hong Kong. So this is me with the beard and bald and standing in front of the classroom and telling people like the truth is social priming, ingo depletion, power posing. So this is how, you know, the expectations of what um, professors should do over here. But to me, this is uh, uh, unsustainable, especially given um, the, the situation that we're in. I could not see myself do this sort of thing. Uh, most recently in my, uh, I, do, I do audio books when I hike around Hong Kong when it's possible. And the last one that I finished was Adam Grant uh, about uh, Think Again. And I really like this uh, kind of summary of things that I think all of us should adopt, a scientist mindset about humility, learning by doing, confusion is natural, uncertainty is natural, science is messy, and students uh, not only learn science, but can also inform science. Um, so uh, we should be teaching students to question knowledge and, and find ways for them to really seek out the truth rather than telling them what the truth is. In Maastricht University, I've learned a system of teaching called uh, problem-based learning. So no more of this, uh, you know, uh, I tell students what the truth is, but students work on problems. Uh, they have teams of up to 10. Uh, the, the tutor stands in the back. It does not interfere. Students do everything. They uh, decide what their learning goals are. Uh, they facilitate themselves. They create mind maps, and then they do the discussion. Again. So everything is like hands-on uh, learning. Uh, so these are the principles that I kind of saw in Maastricht and said that I wanted to do even if I come here to HKU using a more traditional approach. And I've tried best, best I can to implement this. So the beginning when I came in and people said you should teach advanced social psychology, fundamentals of social psychology, here's the book. I said no more of these books. I'm going to put all these books aside. Let's uh, ignore those for a while because every other page does something over there that I feel... Uh, um, I have my own doubts about stuff or stuff that I already know does not replicate very well. No more instructor truth. Uh, it's not like I have some uh, great knowledge right now that I can bestow upon my students. We have to figure this out together. So I invite students to come with me on a journey. Uh, things are going to be student led. Uh, they're going to be doing actual science hands on uh, leading to publishable research with real impact. They're going to go through the entire scientific process. So they're going to do peer review on each other and they're going to be using the latest tools and trends in psychological science, including pre-registrations, power analysis, effect size, confidence intervals, uh, equivalence testing, uh, Bayesian, some of them do so uh, really hands on top of the state of the art uh, kind of uh, research. Um, and of course, implementing all the things about open science. If you want to uh, look uh, what that looks like, uh, our syllabus is about 25 to 30 pages long. And I give a quiz on the syllabus on the second week just to make sure that everybody understands uh, this contract. This is the add drop period, the first two weeks. So they have a chance for them to drop and move to a different instructor if they don't like the way that this is. But after these two weeks, after they've done the quiz on the syllabus, in order to make sure that we understand one another and, and align the expectations, they uh, proceed. So you can have a look at our syllabus and see how extensive it is just to prepare them for what they're about to go through. So there's lots of uncertainty in this kind of course. There's lots of things that students are not used to. So I believe that it's very important to have an extensive syllabus to align expectation. Everything that I do, all my teaching materials uh, are on the Open Science Framework. And because uh, we had to do the last semester on Zoom, so we recorded everything and also shared this. So if you wanna see uh, what we did on Zoom, I tried to make it as interactive as possible, um, but you know, Zoom uh, gave, gave us some limitations, restrictions, uh, but you'll get a sense of what it means to teach open science to undergraduates and the kind of discussions that we have with them. Moving forward to kind of like the, the core of what I want to share with you and the invitations that I have for you, we have these uh, three main components. Uh, the heart and what I started from 
is these, re are these replications and extensions. But in the last year, we've also been doing science assessments. Um, now an increasing trend that people talk about in the open science community are these red teams, uh, which you'll pay somebody from that or you'll give them uh, monetary incentives in order to come in and, and assess your work. I say, let's give this to undergraduates. There's that so they, they can learn from the process. We can train them to do this well. We can mass mobilize undergraduates to check the work. And we've shown with a proof of concept that they can do unbelievable work in checking uh, others uh, articles and other peer participations. So that's one uh, direction that we took this towards. And then uh, community resources. So I'll, I'll show you some of these templates, the guides and the books. Oh, and this is here in this slide. So the nice thing about this uh, three years that we've been doing this is that I decided rather than me telling them, how do you do replications? How do you do extensions? How do you do uh, call checks? How do you do a replication assessment, uh, um, peer review, quantitative manuscript, how to do any of these things? If it's going to be up to me to write this down for them, it's going to take forever. It's going to have lots of errors and it's uh, and never going to end. Um, and it, just a lot of work, uh, not very high quality. Uh, everything that you'll see here is collaborative. These are Google Docs, uh, just like we do stuff in SIPs. Anybody can come in into these things, add their name as a collaborator, uh, improve, edit, comment, whatever it is that you want to do, you can come uh, help. And if you look at some of these, now they're very extensive, like this collaborative effect size confidence intervals power analysis guide is, is very, very well done. And each one of these uh, eventually is, uh, hopefully, will become um, a submission to a journal. So if you come, you contribute, you add your name, you're a collaborator. This is how the open science community works. So you're invited. This is a partial list. You can go over here and see the full list of how that works. Now, the remarkable thing, and this is, I honestly never expected this to happen, uh, but uh, uh, we've, we've published quite a lot in 2020. And I want to emphasize that all of these are students. So uh, what we do typically is that the students do uh, these projects. So all these underlined names are students from here, from, from uh, HKU. The first author is typically an invited early career researcher. So somebody with some experience, it could be you taking over some of our students' work. So you'll be a first author, then the students, then the teaching assistants, and then me trailing at the end. And you and the students are shared co-authors in, in a note. Uh, and you'll see that we have quite a few of those. So for example, uh, Ziano over here uh, uh, did quite a lot of these projects. We have uh, quite a few that did more than one project. So if you've done one, you feel that this is going well, you can take more. And I'll tell you just how many of those uh, we have. Uh, we have a lot more than just uh, these 12. We also have these preprints. If you want to uh, see more of these preprints, this is just to say each one of those is a completed replication of a classic finding in judgment and decision making. Some of these articles have 5,000 citations, 3,000 citations, and have never been replicated since the 1970s and 80s. So it's, uh, it's uh, great that the students were able to revisit this and then that he, it has met the criteria for submission and publication in uh, some great journals that I think anybody in social psychology or in economics uh, um, knows and understands. So we aim towards the more open science friendly uh, journals. Uh, for me, I'm happy with preprints, but it's also nice to kind of give a boost to uh, these early career researchers and all these uh, students. And I already know that this really makes a difference for them in their CVs when they go to both academia uh, and, and to the industry. So that's nice. Uh, and even in, in 2021, even during uh, you know, pandemic, COVID and everything, we keep uh, uh, getting out these, these papers. Even though all of us are overwhelmed with everything that's happening, I feel like the power of collaboration really brings everybody together and enables uh, this sort of thing. So this is an open invitation for you to come in, have a look uh, at things, decide if you want to join our project or not. So what did we do? Just to kind of like give you a taste, we've completed so far uh, 72 pre-registered applications and extensions. Uh, about half of them are now being led by or published uh, by early career researchers, which leaves you with about 35 opportunities to join us on stuff that we've completed. In addition, we've also completed 13 registered reports stage one. So this is where we don't have data yet. 
uh, but uh, um, they did simulations of data sets and then we did a uh, very comprehensive pre-registration which is going to be submitted to a journal as a registered report um, plus ongoing thesis work so there's eight of those overall um, towards the end of this year we'll have 100 of these completed now the remarkable thing is this uh, success rate that we've had if you've had some discussions in reproducibility about uh, what are the rates right now, um, social psychology, which we, we thought was pessimistic and, and very low of let's say 30 to 50%. Uh, if we look at other fields in other places, it could be lower than that. Uh, but if we look at judgment and decision-making uh, of the stuff that we've replicated, classics in that domain, uh, by our students, our replication rate is about 70% with some that are mixed or inconclusive. That means that one study perhaps replicated and the other didn't, or one DV replicated and the other didn't. So stuff that we still need to follow up on and some stuff that is, that is unsuccessful. What I want you to think about is not just, okay, judgment decision-making maybe has a higher replicability, right? Maybe it's not randomly sampled, so it's too early to, to, to say. But what I want you to consider and really think about for a second is these are undergraduates. So at the beginning when I came to HKU, I said, I'm gonna run uh, replications with undergraduates here in Hong Kong on Amazon Mechanical Turk and uh, British Polyphic, um, most people said this is never going to work. Undergraduates cannot do this. What is this Hong Kong? Never heard of HKU. You're just a first year assistant professor. Uh, most most folks, if they replied, um, they rep they, some of them were pretty hostile and very pessimistic about our chances. Just think about this. The 70% replication rate doesn't just say something about judgment decision making. It also says something about the work that the students did. Uh, so well done to all the students that were able to achieve uh, this rate. And also with the mixed and inconclusive and unsuccessful. So you don't evaluate something just by the success rate. But my, my evaluation of how good this is, is that even in the mixed, inconclusive and unsuccessful, they had amazing insights. They found things that were wrong in the article, misalignments between the tables, the figures and the text, things that just couldn't be, or they found a way to improve. And when we followed up on this, uh, they were able to solve some of these, these issues. We have two tracks, just like I said, we have either completed pre-registered applications and extensions where we already collected data, or we have um, before data collection register report stage. One, just an example from autumn uh, 2019, I think really was part of, of this uh, uh, collaboration over here. Uh, when we do replication, we just we, we do this very comprehensive. Uh, it's not just you know small samples on you know some in one one investigation. We crowdsource things, so we separate this into two teams of two students working independently of of one another. Uh, and then part of the process that they pre-review each other, and I'll show you in a second what that looks like. And each one of them runs this on a separate sample. One of, the, one of them is Americans on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and the second is uh, British Polyphic. And then we can compare these samples, we can compare this work. And each one of these groups also designs not just a replication, but also an additional extension to take the, the next step going beyond that. So very large samples, the power is 99 plus. Um, and then we were very lucky because uh, research wouldn't fund us, but the teaching development grant here at University of Hong Kong, they were very excited about students actually doing uh, real uh, science work. So they gave us some money and we were able to uh, do these um, large samples. Just to show you the process, uh, they go over the article, they analyze the article, they design a Qualtrics, which is a serving uh, software, a website that you can design uh, replications on, simple replications that we do in judgment decision making, everything can be done on Qualtrics. They generate uh, random data sets and then they conduct uh, data analysis on the random data sets, which means this is the data analysis plan. They write up the pre-registration report, they peer review each other, so the two teams kind of exchange, they worked independently and now they can uh, check each other and learn from one another. Then I go on Twitter and I go on, uh, you know, recruiting people like I recruited Reedy and, and some of the other uh, EC, ECRs, early career researchers in our team, get some feedback. They go and they comment on the Google Docs. Sometimes we're very lucky to also get the original authors to come in and comment on students' work. So just imagine an undergraduate student, you know, second year uh, writing a Google Doc and then suddenly the person from the 1980s that they replicated <laughs> comes in and comments on their Google Doc. This makes them very motivated and excited about this. 
Finally, they have one week to revise. Then I have uh, two uh, sleepless weeks of uh, collecting all the data and doing the pre registrations. I give them the data sets, they analyze this separately, then they compare notes, final report, once again, do all the external reviews, uh, everything is open, and finally, revise final report. This revised final report is an APA style submission ready report. It has everything in it. And I do mean everything. And uh, OSF ready upload directory, um, everything that you need in order to make this open reproducible, very extensive uh, supplementaries. And if you want to see what that looks like, I really invite you to take a look at this work. It's, uh, I think, outstanding what the students were, were capable of doing. I, I think I opened this uh, here somewhere, just to give you a sense what this looks like. So this is the air table of that semester. Just so you can see, we have these two teams. Uh, the samples are very uh, large. So you can see the samples over here are 750, 810, 2,200. Uh, so it depends on their power analysis. Then you can just go on the Dropbox and, and have a look at what it is that they've done. And if you open any of this, then you'll see that you know it really includes everything that you would expect. It has the Jamovi files and it has uh, uh, you know, everything that you would need in order to reproduce what it is that they've done in that, in that project. So please do go and have a look at what undergraduates are capable of doing in terms of uh, science. Register reports, that's the other track that we've had. This is what we did last semester because I did not have any funding, so I couldn't do data collection, plus data collection during COVID times on uh, MTurk and British Prolific, we still need to look at what that means. So for now, these are registered reports and, and it will be submitting those as such. Once again, we have two extensions for each team. Um, so um, uh, you, you can, if you prefer registered reports, you can have a look at this. The process is very, very similar, only we end this uh, by having a pre-registration that was peer-reviewed, and this is what we sent to the journals uh, for that to be peer-reviewed. If you want to have a look at that, you're very welcome to. This is the link, and I think they've done uh, remarkable work in that as well. Um, so this is a comparison of these two. If you prefer working on completed projects, you can do that, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, whatever we did, my extensions and all that, uh, if we if we did something uh, wrong in terms of you know the replication, we didn't do exactly what was supposed to happen. It is it is what it is, and we just have to argue uh, for it. And most of the work here, if you take the lead on that, is about verifying what the students did. It's integrating the two groups together into one manuscript, and then prepping it up for uh, submission. So we have quite a few uh, uh, lead authors that do that. If you prefer to have a real input on the project, uh, then you can take uh, the register reports and really not only just verify, but just like add your own insights, add your own extensions, play around with it. Um, so both you and the reviewers can give input feedback so that we can improve on those. That's the nice thing about a register report. So whatever your preference is, you're very welcome. This is the comparison of the uh, process. And this is the open invitation for you to decide what you want to do. If you don't want to take lead, no problem. If you want to be a reviewer, you can be a reviewer. Uh, if you're willing to review with us all the way towards the publication, uh, then, then you get co-authorship as part of the team, perhaps not the lead, but you know, like me towards the end after the students who actually uh, did the work. So you can choose any one of these paths. Uh, if you want to hear from the actual the, the ECRs, the early career researchers, not just for me, uh, uh, Adrian over here um, contemplated on this. You can see him on, on YouTube and, and listen to him talk about what it means to join this mass replication project. So he's been doing well in that and been very, very involved in quite a few projects. Uh, if you prefer reading, um, all of our students and early career researchers are invited to uh, participate in the psychology today column. So we've got two perspectives. One is a guided thesis student, Ariana, who got her work published. Uh, um, I think it was, yeah, last year we published uh, her thesis work. And this is early career researcher perspective. And both of them, I like it. It's not just they write about, you know, we publish something, they reflect on their journey towards open science. So if you want to hear what it means for them, as students, as early career researchers to join this kind of projects and take part in open science, um, then this is, these are opportunities for you to kind of read about their experiences and see how this uh, fits uh, with, with your journey. 
about science assessments. We've done quite a few of those, so we pre-tested pre this uh, twice. Once we did this over published replication register reports from AMPPS or from Perspective of Psychological Science. So we took published work of original uh, replications of original um, uh, targets. And then what they did, uh, they did over there is that they went over the original and they assessed the original article, and then they went over the uh, replication and they assessed both their pre-registrations and their final products, and they tried to rerun their code. And we did this with six, and then I am just like amazing, amazing work of what they did over there. And it seems like even with the many labs, even with the mass collaborations, and uh, there, there are some places that we need to improve. Not everything is reproducible. Not everything is as open as we thought. There's some things for us to, to take into consideration as we move forward with these mass collaborations. And it's good to have somebody revisit those to see if we really do a good enough job when we publish these uh, mass replications. So these are six well published mass replications of RRR. And then um, some people said, it's uh, great that you're looking at published uh, replication reports, but did you look at your own? And then I'm like, yeah, okay, let's, let's look at our own. So they revisited this semester, or last semester, they revisited 14 of our own replications to see how well we did. And then they learned from that. So if you wanna see that, or you wanna see the template that we use for how to do assessment, you can go into this. If you wanna see a tutorial of how to do an assessment, what does it mean to do an assessment? Uh, we have some uh, tutorials uh, over here. I just want to say that I feel like this is the most important direction for us to move on forward. So after completing 100 replications, I feel like we've, we've done plenty over there. And I think really the next step is more about meta science and trying to revisit and improve the literature. These are the two uh, components of replications, extensions, and science assessments. The last one is about community resources. This is going to be very brief. One tremendous example of uh, what students can do is that uh, at the beginning, I tried to tell them about the open science uh, credibility revolution, and there was no good book this year. Uh, we, we've got Stuart Ritchie came out with, uh, with a good book on that, but up until two semesters ago, we did not have a book. So I invited the students to write the book and uh, they did this collaboratively. So now you can see the power of collaboration. They wrote a 200 pages book on open science and the credibility revolution. Go have a look at this, it's uh, remarkable. Um, if you wanna see more about what they've done, open science primers and guides, opinion piece, phenomenon reviews, and so forth. Final uh, couple of slides, main takeaways for me about this project, some uh, messages that I want to relay uh, to you. I want you to just imagine what would happen if we would do more of these mass collaborations? Oh, everything that I just showed you is one lab. Actually, uh, it, it, it started from me, but now it has grown to a community. But this is like one community. Just imagine that we had more of these. Um, perhaps we would be able to address this uh, so-called replication reproducibility crisis and, and move forward faster, better. Um, so we, we can do this more. If, if others are willing to, to do similar things, then you don't need to uh, start from nothing. You have all the resources that we've built. Just take it, use it as you, as you wish. You don't even have to credit us. Just like take it and, and start implementing this on your own. All of this is done by students and early career researchers. We actually don't need uh, the senior researchers. We, it's nice to get them involved, but actually we can do a lot of this on our own. Just imagine what would happen if, if every course would be like this, where students actually do hands-on science and do replications, reproducibility, uh, open science, meta science. Uh, it would be amazing if we can turn all of our courses to something like this. And everything is open and collaborative. And because of that, we do much, much, much better work. The students are capable of remarkable things. So just imagine what would happen if everything was open and collaborative. Uh, this is definitely the way that we should be going. Um, and then finally, uh, join and lead. There's so many opportunities, not just in our project, but if you want to do CREP or you want to do Psychological Science Accelerate or you want to do riots or reproducibility or journal clubs, whatever it is that you want to do, so many opportunities and all of these are driven by early career researchers. It's, it's, it's really inspiring to see everything that's happening. I am on Twitter, very active, and every time I see one of these projects come up, it just blows, blows my mind. 
And you really have the power to make a real change in the scientific community. You can step up, take responsibility, be involved and change the way that things are. Uh, if we leave it up to you know, the status quo, uh, perhaps the senior researchers, it's gonna take a while, but if we take action and, and start implementing things, there's a chance that you know, in a decade, things will be a lot better. How to join us, this is the link, all the things that you can do uh, with us. If you wanna suggest new directions, I'm always open. Um, for, for new ideas, please let's, let us know. Some people approach me and say, can we do prediction markets? Great, we implemented prediction markets. So if you have other ideas, please let us know. Everything that I just told you, all this information, I know it's a bit overwhelming, but if you wanna dig deep into that, everything is available on this website or just scan the, the barcode. I'm very happy to talk to uh, you about any of these components or about what it is that you're facing. If you need our help, if you want us to assist you, guide you through your journey in open science, meta science, uh, we're very happy to help. We have a lot of resources. We have a very enthusiastic team. Just let me know. You can contact me uh, on this email. I'm very active on Twitter, so you can just go ahead and, and DM me or, or whatever interaction you feel comfortable with. We also have a mailing list with a lot of updates. There's an open science uh, workshop in two weeks that is open to everybody, um, nine in the morning, I think, in UK time. So you're very welcome to subscribe to this mailing list and see all the updates about future workshops. So thank you very much. I'm very happy to take some questions and discuss any of this with you further. Thank you. That was that was awesome. Um, I guess if anyone has questions, feel free to fire into the chat or put hands up. We'll try and keep track of who who goes first. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start off with a something I'm quite curious about is maybe your take or your some of your kind of views on your particular experience of the kind of support or maybe barriers that you had to setting up a project like this. Um, I know that in, in a lot of ways, there's maybe unique aspects for everybody in, in terms of the yeah, the, the support and lack of support maybe in some cases. So I'm curious how, how you found HKU in terms of setting up quite, quite an impressive and kind of broad project. Yes, that's, that's a good question because I feel it's, it's important. Um, I think, um, you know, some people walk away from presentations like this thinking, oh, it's, it's gonna be easy for us to implement this. But I already know, being in SIPs in some of these uh, workshops, sitting together with others who have tried this, um, this, is, this does not always work. There's lots of challenges. And um, I think uh, it's, it's much more than just me being involved and in, in trying to you know, do this in a certain mindset. I think there's a whole ecosystem that is required to make something like this uh, work. Uh, but it is possible. First, I want to say that uh, I started this for my first year of assistant professor. And when I was a postdoc on the job market looking for opportunities, I had different options. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of times I got the advice of don't be confrontational. Don't try to change things. Don't say too much about open science. Just like stick to the publications, show what it is that you've done, count the number of citations. And, and this is what you should talk about. Uh, revolutionary novelty kind of research, but actually I thought of doing things differently. So when I went on job talks, I put my identity as an open science researcher up front, saying this is what I want to do. Uh, actually, I have novelty work, but I'm, I want to put this aside for a bit until I try to make sense of what literature do I trust, what findings I found reliable so that I'll have uh, building blocks that I could build on top of that. So before I go into novelty, I want to reassess what it is that I think is trustworthy. I had a general feeling that judgment and decision-making tends to replicate better, but I had no actual evidence for that. And I wanted to try this um, on my own. So a few places where I went and gave a job talk, sometimes before I even finished the job talk, they're kind of like, okay, thank you. We understand, uh, move on. 
uh, but HKU is different. So I think they were enthusiastic, even though their system is different and they have their own way of doing things, they were supportive of this and they uh, offered me the flexibility to really change things. So a lot of places, if you want to change coursework, you have to go through a committee. First of all, as an assistant professor, it's impossible. But then let's say they would open this opportunity. There's a whole committee. It takes two years until they sit down and they decide on something. And then the changes are very, very minor. Just consider what HKU did here. Uh, they allowed um, somebody like me, assistant professor coming out of nowhere with very little experience to, to change an entire course, not just one course, three courses and try things out. And this is a big risk for them to take. And at the beginning, the students pushed back. The students uh, had a lot of criticism and they had a lot of questions and uh, some complaints during the semester. What is this? This is not what we signed up for. Um, um, how, how does this relate to what's been done in this course before? But what I ask HEU is to give me you know, two semesters, one year in order to try things out. And if at the end, we haven't delivered and things don't seem to be going according to plan, then we can revisit this. And uh, they've been very supportive. Not only did they allow me uh, this, but they also gave me an amazing team of uh, teaching assistants, all of them with master's degree and research experience that were able to support me in this. If it was just up to me, this would have never happened, but just uh, all my teaching assistants who are now my collaborators and co-authors, um, some of them are now pursuing PhDs in different parts of the world. Uh, it's, it's amazing uh, that HQU allowed them to work with me. They could have been to somebody else, but they gave uh, some of their best to work with me because this was challenging. So all of that together, I think, uh, came uh, to um, make, make this successful. But I think the main component is the, definitely the students. Uh, I've, I've done postdocs in the US and the Netherlands. I grew up in Israel. I've been to different parts of the world working with different students. There's something about the, the atmosphere here at HKU that has to do with excellence and pursuing excellence, perhaps also a bit competitive, but it's also um, the willingness to really, you know, follow and 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 like you set you set a certain path but follow things to the end like really whatever it is that you set the goal towards they're gonna do their best in order to to go with that all all the way to the end so first semester honestly i set unrealistic expectations thinking if they'll meet me halfway uh, this would be tremendous success not only have they met me all the way but they far exceeded that coming to me afterwards saying, can, can we do more of this? Um, this, this is great. Can, can, we, can we work with you on other projects? So I've never, I've never seen more dedicated, passionate uh, students and their ability to deliver and execute. It's not to say that this is impossible uh, anywhere else, but I do feel like it, you, need, you need the support from students. Uh, you need students that would be enthusiastic about this and wanting to try different things. It doesn't always work. I would say 70% were like that, but you always have the 20, 30% that would push back. But as a general rule, the students that we uh, have here at HKU that I had, uh, you know, the, the pleasure of working with uh, were really uh, delivered despite uncertainty, despite uh, risks, despite all sorts of uh, challenges. If you consider just the last year, it's not only COVID, Hong Kong has been going through all sorts of things. Uh, even despite all, all that, they still uh, came through and delivered big time. So all that ecosystem together really makes me very proud of this team, of the students of HKU. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see what's gonna happen if we try this in other places. We're working with different places like Brazil where they're just taking our stuff and let's say uh, translating this to Portuguese and running this. So you can just take whatever it is that we've done. Everything is open. Don't even to, need to credit us and just try this with your students. So they're trying this in, in Brazil, uh, hopefully in France uh, soon. Uh, some people are trying their own uh, replications about some other stuff. So you can try this out and see how it goes. The one thing I can say is that we'd be very happy now with this team of 50 early career researchers we'd be happy to help you. If you wanna try this sort of thing and you're not sure how to do it, reach out to us and we'll help you. Oh, awesome, thanks. 
Uh, Matt, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, so Sam and uh, Sarah and I and a few other people are on a, the Experimental Psychology Open Science Committee. And the, the comment you made about it taking two years to change anything and then it's only small changes definitely rings true. Um, so I, I guess uh, specifically what I wanted to ask is that when we, when we talk about doing this kind of thing, um, you know, more group work, actually doing stuff that produces things, one of the, the big things that comes up is how do you get individual student assessments out of what are essentially group projects? And I wondered if you'd face that kind of question and what your answer to it was. Yeah, that's that's a good one because I think we got a lot of pushback for that. Um, and really, I needed to revisit this almost every semester to try different models and see what would work. All the assessments that we do are group work. Uh, and there's, there's all sorts of uh, issues uh, with that. But I think, um, you know, if you structure this correctly, there are ways to overcome all sorts of problems with uh, group work. For example, of course, you have free writers. So you're worried about maybe somebody will, you know, put in on the work and some others will just cruise through. I think one of the nice things about open science is that if you do everything with Google Docs, if you do everything open transparent, it's very easy to track who does what where. So in Google Docs, you look at revisions, you can see very clearly who did uh, what where. Um, also, them knowing that original authors, that people from Twitter, uh, that you know, early career researchers are coming in and commenting on their Google Docs, and that everything that they do is going to be shared with the world and submitted to a journal gives them a sense of responsibility where even if they thought about free writing, uh, it's, it's no longer an option because they know that, you know, Till the end of time, this is this is what they're part of. So I think the open science, the collaboration, the way that we do things, really makes it very very hard. You really need to be a very selfish free rider that doesn't care about anything in order to, in that kind of system, say I don't care about any of that. And then it's very easy for us to find these kinds of things. We also have a system, it's open, it's done by uh, NUS in Singapore. Uh, I think it's even open source uh, that, that's called the teammates, uh, team evaluations, where uh, in the middle of the semester and the end of the semester, they evaluate each other. If you wanna see how we did this, I'm happy to share. It's also in our uh, open science framework uh, course sharing. So you can see the structure of what uh, this evaluation is and they evaluate each other's contribution. You know, So 100 is what we would expect of you if you were a good team member, uh, less than that. And deviations from that, we adjust the group work score to, uh, you know, according to what it is that the other group members evaluated your work on. So let's say if you did 50% of that, we make adjustment to the group score uh, to reflect your own uh, score. Plus, uh, they need to say, uh, and I think this is part of open science, uh, like credit, you know, contributor, contributorship, uh, what it is that you've done, which part are you responsible for? Uh, so our teaching assistants are able to evaluate different parts and also uh, tell students like this, this was a better part than the other part. Uh, because it's collaborative work, of course, they all help each other do better. But if, let's say, there was one person who uh, completely was off the, the, the team, uh, we would be able to see that in their own, let's say, section. We would be able to see their contributorship and then make assessments uh, based on that. And I'll come back to the point of it's all about uh, setting expectations, aligning expectations. If you uh, set the expectations uh, well, uh, you know, quiz on the syllabus might sound ridiculous, but I, I came to understand that this is, this is needed. They need to know how they're being assessed um, and you need to allow them some flexibility in order to say, I'm going to drop this course. So if you're doing a proof of concept, you know, start this in one course that's maybe an elective and then give them the opportunity after two weeks to drop. And then you'll see all the free riders are going to drop because this is too intense for them and they understand that they can't get away with it. So um, set, aligning expectations, giving them another option, maybe not forcing them into this kind of thing. 
And then I feel like, uh, you, you know, it's funny, but um, sometimes we start off with, let's say, uh, 150 people registered, but at the end, the people who sign up are 70. So like about half of them decide that they don't want to take part of this. 70 is still big, um, but it just means that a lot of people, when they did the quiz on the syllabus and when they tried to choose teams, decided this is not for them and that's completely okay. Uh, we, we actually encourage this. There are other instructors, there's other options for them to choose from. So really aligning expectations, uh, giving them options and, and really making sure that you have ways of assessing this and that this has an impact on, uh, you know, from group assessment to individual assessment, there is some compensation, not only for bad work, but also if you were exceptional, there are bonus points. So taking all of that into consideration, I feel like now we have a good way of dealing uh, with that. And everything that I do in my courses now is only group work. There is actually no individual work. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Um, well, in that case, to, to keep us within our, our time slot, um, thank you. Thank you so much for, for Green's talk. Thank you, uh, really, for kind of organizing everything. Um, thanks, everybody. We'll see everybody next term. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>